Thank you for tuning in to On Record PR. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not reflect the views or positions of the entities they represent. Apple is positioning themselves as a privacy champion and it's, it paid off, right? And what they have, this new thing is basically every time you use a third party app on the iPhone and it will pop up with a message, hey, do you allow them to track you or not? Literally, Apple is forcing all the app developers to get the user's permission to use their data to track them on different apps that, that they don't own. So that's a perfect example. I think Apple's story is going to be a textbook example of how you use privacy and you know use it as your competitive advantage. Welcome to On Record PR. I'm your host, Gina Rubel. Today, I'm going on record with Ai Hong Yu, Chief Privacy Counsel of CDK Global. She oversees the company's privacy, AI, and data governance programs. Welcome to the show, Ai Hong. Thank you so much, Gina. Thank you for having me. Oh, it is my pleasure and our pleasure. So I'm going to get right into the questions. Would you tell us a little bit about CDK Global and what you do for the company? Sure. You know, CDK is a company that is a software company. We provide the SaaS solutions to car dealers and manufacturers. Literally, you know, I usually use the simple language to tell people what we do because it's really the products itself are so complicated. Literally, we provide all the tech solutions to car dealerships and manufacturers for the operation of the entire dealership. So from the time you walk into a dealership, they take your information to the time you, you, know, you buy a car, you borrow loans from the uh, banks and you know, get your insurance and you come back for services, for your warranties, all those things in the back office are handled by CDK systems. Wow, so that really is a great introduction for why we're going to talk about the significant trends or events that have shaped data privacy and why it's so important. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, you talk about CDK, I would tell you it's a B2B company, but at another level, it's also a B2C company because we process the data on behalf of the dealers, right? We process all these consumers. So in the privacy field, and I will tell you, today's privacy landscape is like a very complex web. You know, in the past years alone, in 2023, for example, you know, in addition to California, which is a leader in the state privacy laws in the U.S., four other states have their comprehensive privacy law become effective in 2023. And eight other states have passed their laws and most of them will become effective later this year. So it's like a, a huge wave of privacy legislation. And at the federal level, you know, many people are hoping that, you know, instead of dealing with all this almost like patchwork, right, you deal with from state to state, uh, we would prefer to have a comprehensive federal law. So that has been like in talk for a couple of years now, but I don't think in the election year there's any hope that we will pass a federal law. So that will not happen. However, you know, some federal agencies, they have been stepped into this area, you know, the privacy and the data security. You know, whenever you talk about privacy and data security, they go hand in hand. It's inseparable. So the SEC passed an important regulation last year that requires company to disclose their, you know, cybersecurity practice and risks in their annual filings, quarterly filings. And one of the most impactful provision of the SEC rule is to require public companies to report any material uh, data incident in four business days. And that is a very, very demanding timeline because usually there, if there's a cyber attack or even you know human error uh, resulted uh, data incident, usually it takes a lot of time to investigate what exactly happened, right? And by the time of the fourth day, you probably know very little information or very partial information. So 
the public companies are having this dilemma, basically. On the one hand, you don't want to disclose too much and only to find out some of them is not true. And then you have to retract that those statements and or mislead the investors. But on the other hand, if you report too little, then you're not complying with SEC rules. So it's a pretty delicate balance to strike for companies. And another agency, the FTC, has been very active in publishing rules. They're using the privacy laws, the existing laws, to enforce the uh, data protection. There are a lot of cases uh, for the FTC enforcement in 23. You know, the one important rule that they have updated is the safeguards rule. It has similar requirements. It requires the non-banking financial institutions like car dealerships or mortgage brokers to report data incidents. The so-called incidents, they, are, they define that as a unauthorized access of unencrypted data. So that will be very impactful for some industries because those type of incidents actually happen very often in companies now. So that's a big change. You know, on the international front, you have the EU and the US finally signed the privacy framework. And this framework provides a mechanism for companies to transfer personal data from the EU to the US. But, you know, most, and I will, what I can tell you is that the future of this new framework is very uncertain. The reason is that the, between US and the EU, they signed a two similar framework in the past, one called Safe Harbor, the other called Privacy Shield, and both were invalidated. It was challenged because, and it was basically announced by the EU Court of Justice, you know, saying that the agreement is invalid. And the reason is that the US is considered not providing adequate protections for personal data. You know, on the one hand, yeah, (laughs) shock, right? Yes, the fundamental reason for that is there's a US law, it's called the Foreign uh, Intelligence Surveillance Act. It was really an old law back in the 70s. In uh, 1978, the law was enacted to give the government, the, the US government, the authority to impose surveillance on certain individuals or organizations for foreign intelligence purposes, right? But the concern and the criticism there is that very often this law is abused and there's a lack of transparency there and there's a discriminating kind of a surveillance on individuals and businesses. So this law is still there. Therefore, this new framework, the future of this new privacy framework is really in doubt. You know, the person who successfully challenged the, the previous two frameworks uh, Mr. Max Schrems, he's an Austrian activist lawyer, and he basically he he invalidated what well, he filed a complaint that eventually resulted in the invalidation of those two frameworks. So he has already indicated that he's going to file a complaint against this third one. So we will see. So you can tell, you know, in today's world, the privacy compliance world is complicated. For business, you know. The question, the critical question is that how do you comply with all these privacy laws without slowing down the technology innovation and the creative work there, right? That's the quick question. You know, in my mind, I always have this picture in my mind about the privacy landscape. You know, all the businesses, the companies are like, you know, driving this all racing cars, rushing forward and in the new field, and the field, you see a lot of objects there. So are those objects road blockers or accelerators? I think the answer really depends on how you approach those objects, right? From what angle, use what kind of strategies and how much effort you are willing to put in to think through. That's a brilliant analogy. Are they accelerators or road blockers? And you, know, you highlighted a number of the challenges One of which is just the inconsistencies, the ambiguities, and the number of different privacy regulations a global company has to comply with. So you mentioned the US, you mentioned the EU, 
But as a global company, you're managing them. And it's not just the U.S. for our listeners. It's every single state because there's no federal law. So I just wrote a blog about New Jersey's new Privacy Act that just passed a few yes. weeks ago. So now yes. you have to come up to speed with that on top of everything else. I don't know how you do it. I think it's incredibly daunting. And I do hope the U.S. comes up with something on the federal level to start managing the playing field, as you will, for people who are working in that space. So other than challenges, what are some of the opportunities that can arrive from effectively managing and communicating your data privacy practices? You know, that, that's a great question. You know, that, that's exactly what I was thinking. It really depends on how you look at these things, right? You know, if it's a difficult problem to solve, and if you can solve the problem in the, in the right way, then you're the winner. You know, for business, uh, if you have really a strategy that incorporates privacy in every aspect of your business, basically you, you form a strategy where you don't treat privacy as a purely a legal compliance, but as an operation, right? And then you're going to have the competitive advantage. So what does that mean? You know, this is something that I'm not making this up. I almost like talk with our people, our product people, our service people every day about this. You know, when when you view it as a compliance, it becomes a burden, right? You have to jump all these hooks to, to reach to the, the other end. But Think about the privacy. These are different from anti-bribery, from code of business conduct. The privacy is all about how you use data, how you collect the personal data, how you use it, how you store it, how long you keep it, and then it, are you implementing a data minimization uh, policy there? Are you collecting too much data there, right? And from a consumer's perspective, are you considering what the consumer's expectations are, right? And in today's world, you know, it's a digital world. The data travels so fast in a very complex world. But if you can, you know, treat privacy as an operational matter, you know, I would use an analogy. You know, if I tell you there's a product feature that you can add, and that will instantly make you millions of dollars of revenue. It's a no-brainer. You're going to do it right away, right? And the same thing as privacy. If you add all these privacies, incorporate them into the product development, into your service processes, into your website, and you earn the trust and reputation, you know, good reputation, then you're going to make money because that at some point they will convert into profit, either directly or indirectly, right? So that's how, you know, Apple is a great example. You know, when you talk about all these big companies, we heard very often we heard the enforcement cases against the Facebook, Google, Amazon, you know, you name it. All the companies have so far been paid some sort of fine in enforcement cases. But Apple has been a privacy champion. That's how they have positioned themselves. Right. And when you think about, you know, I remember I was at the IAPP conference and they actually invited Tim Cook, the CEO, to be the uh, keynote speaker. It was pretty inspiring. This was a couple of years ago. But Apple actually started their privacy strategy many years ago in 2014. I remember that was the year when Tim Cook actually published a public letter to consumers, basically to announce that, you know, the whole reason we collect your information, we use your information, is to make good product, is to make something that is good for you. We're not going to sell your information. You know, if someone tells you, because you use free internet, so you have to give your data to us to make money and don't trust them. That's literally what he was saying. And since then, you know, they have, in their whole product development, they have built all this what I call the privacy infrastructure, uh, meaning, you know, just give you an example, their hardwares like cell phones or uh, MacBook, they are all built to be able to uh, have the high ability to process data locally, a very high power to process data. That make it possible for them to keep certain data on your local device. It never, it's never sent to the cloud. So Apple doesn't see it. 
for example, like the facial recognition, right? We all use the facial recognition, you know, instead of a password to unlock our phone and the Siri, the recording. All these things Apple's are saying, all this data is, you know, kept on your local device. Okay, you own your data, you own your privacy there. We don't have it, we don't see it. You don't send it to the cloud like other players do. For example, you know, a lot of things that Apple can do about, you know, arranging your photos to make a movie. They use their AI on their local device and in the software to make all these little videos. And it's really a very attractive app. And I think Google does similar things. I'm not an Android user, but I know it does similar things, but they have to send the photos, videos to cloud. And Amron's Alexa, you know, does the same thing. It's not saved locally. So compared with those solutions, Apple is positioning themselves as a privacy champion. And it's, it paid off, right? And, you know, what they have, this new thing is basically every time you use a third party app on the iPhone and it will pop up with a message, hey, do you allow them to track you or not? Literally, Apple is forcing all the app developers to get the user's permission to use their data to track them on different apps that they don't own. So that's a perfect example. I think Apple's story is going to be a textbook example of how you use privacy and you know use it as your competitive advantage. That is a perfect anecdote. And with that, Ai Hong, we are going to pause for a message from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Furia Ruble Communications. In the ever-changing business ecosystem, it's crucial for law firms and businesses to maintain a focus on innovation, differentiation, and efficiency to sustain their relevance and competitive edge. Furia Ruble's Stride Services equips domestic and international law firms and businesses to pinpoint obstacles and inefficiencies, distinguish true unique selling propositions, optimize processes, and adjust to shifting client requirements. To learn more about Furia Ruble's Stride services, visit furiaruble.com backslash stride. Welcome back, everyone. And uh, what a great thought about Apple being the textbook of data privacy. I love that. I am a proud Apple iPhone user for that reason, because I really do care about data privacy. So the world has witnessed many high-profile data breaches, as you know, and I wonder how have those types of incidents affected the perception of data privacy among consumers and what lessons can businesses learn from those situations? Oh, yeah. You know, that's another great question. And then a question that, you know, we deal with every day almost. These high profile data breaches, you know, we all know them. You know, know, the big names, you name it, Target, Walmart, Facebook, Microsoft, Verizon, you know, uh, solar winds, uh, colonial pipelines, you know, all these big names, they were involved in some sort of a big data breaches, right? Those high profile data breaches are very visible because they're headline news. And for consumers, they not only read headline news, a lot of us have received the letters from these companies, right? To tell us, hey, unfortunately, your data was breached. Okay, it was leaked and was hacked and obtained still by someone else. And we we know in today's world, data breaches are just not avoidable. You know, ironically, you know, if there's anything good that comes out of it, that would be the awareness. You know, it has actually helped to raise the public's awareness about data protection, right? And then the consumers now started to ask, oh, you know, whoever, which business has my data, I want to know what kind of a company they are, if they have enough reasonable security measures in place to safeguard my data, right? And on top of that, hey, tell me, I don't even know what kind of information you have about me. Oh, yeah, you know, I have all these rights under the privacy law. I can go to any business to ask them, tell me what information you have about me and how you use my information. Do you sell my information? Who do you share this information with, right? And how long do you keep it? And after I'm done with your business, I no longer want to do business with you. 
are you going to purge everything or are you going to keep my data somewhere and this data will travel somewhere in the internet? So that actually raised the consumer's individual's awareness, which is a great thing. You know, for, for companies, it actually has the same effect. It has raised the, the awareness among the leaders, among the CEOs, CISOs, and, you know, the questions for the company nowadays is not whether you are going to have a data breach, it's when. OK, <laughs> somebody's, you know, all the companies have had some sort of it's either cyber attack or it's because of human being. You have a data leak. Right. So the companies, it kind of give the companies the incentive to basically you know, to train their employees, make sure that they have the right programs, the security, privacy programs in place and also investing their security and privacy. And it, that actually helped the company a lot to uh, well, actually help the, us, the privacy and the security professionals to make our uh, life work a little bit easier there. And you know, another lesson the companies uh, companies have learned is that you have to be prepared, right? That means that you have to have a very solid data incident response. And you not only you, you have it written on the paper, you have to test it again and again so that when the real thing comes, you are prepared and you can respond the way that you planned. I so hope you are speaking my language. I cannot tell you how often we say that because so as a public relations agency, most of what I do is crisis communications. So it's everything from the crisis planning to the tabletop exercises. And so in, and with law firms that are listening, you know, your, your outside counsel, make sure your firms have them because your partners expect them. And so I think it's fascinating. Anyone who doesn't or doesn't carry cyber insurance, it almost feels like they're years and years behind. Yes. So looking ahead, what emerging trends do you foresee in the intersection of data privacy and business strategy? You know, one thing is for sure, privacy laws are here to stay, not only here to stay, you know, it will accelerate, right? The enforcement will accelerate. You know, the companies all should take notes. You know, now we're at the fifth year, the sixth year of GDPR, and we're at the fourth year of CCPA. You know, I think so far the enforcement has been quiet in the U.S. You know, probably the only publicly, uh, you know, under the CCPA, the only openly announced the case was the Sephora case, you know, the company, the selling cosmetics. But I think we're at the stage where the authorities are giving, the regulators are giving companies a little bit of time, a grace period to just get prepared, get your programs in place and, you know, do you do whatever is needed to enhance your privacy program, your security program. But the year 24, you know, in my view, year 24, year 25 are going to be the year for enforcement. You know, the regulators now have enough patience and they have given you, they, they think they have given you sufficient time to get into the position that where you should be. So the enforcement will accelerate. I think that's another trend. You know, in terms of, you know, I think you asked a very good question. The question for business is that how you are going to form and or improve your strategy so that privacy, security are not the road blockers. And then if not accelerators, definitely not road brokers. And in the best scenario, this should be the accelerators. And I think the companies are doing a lot. You will see a trend where the companies are using the advanced technology technologies to promote privacy. You know, I mentioned that um, you know, example is still Apple, right? Once Apple started to require the app uh, developers to ask permissions from users to track them, you probably remember that Facebook openly complained. And then, you know, their, their stock tanked because, you know, one stream of the revenue were threatened, right? That's for advertising. But guess what? You know, after a year now, Facebook, they have revamped their business models and they found new ways to make money. And, you know, another example is Google. All right. Google also rely on advertising, digital advertising. And Google has already announced the plan to stop supporting third party cookies. These cookies track people online on the Internet. 
right? And that's that has been a complaint from people. People feel that, you know, I'm behind the internet, I'm behind my screen, but somehow I feel that there's no privacy because once I started to do something online, it seems that an invisible person is tracking me every minute and knows what I do. And they, they push all this advertising to me. So all this complaints, concerns about privacy, you know, have pushed the company, have given the company the incentive to use technology to actually promote privacy. So the more, uh, you know, something that is called the uh, privacy enhancement technology, they call it the PAT, and that is used more and more in the uh, digital world. They basically to either anonymize or tokenize, you know, the personal information, or they use different ways to use data with the goal to reduce the chance to identify individuals from the data set. So all these new technologies are emerging, you know, in response to the restrictions and the legal requirements about how you have to respect consumers, you know, personal data, their privacy. And I think I see that that's a trend. You know, the other thing that I have to mention, you know, in 2024 is generative AI, right? You yeah. cannot do business without mentioning, without thinking about this generative AI. You know, the, the emergence uh, uh, and the rise of the generative AI have actually imposed the new, um, generated the new legal issues, right? IP, data privacy, and what, what input data you are using, what is the output data, how your algorithms works and how the sausage is made there and who owns the uh, outcome there. And do you have the right to use those data in the first place to train your model. All these legal questions, you know, are just waiting there to be answered. You know, the generative AI was announced, I think the chat GPT was announced in late in November 2022. And since then, we're already seeing 25 litigations, you know, court cases there litigating different things, some on IP, some on data uh, privacy, some on other issues. You know, and when I think about trend, I'm thinking, you know, generative AI is really smart, okay? And yes, it has created legal issues that we have to answer, we have to solve. But on the other end, maybe generative AI is the answer to those problems that they have created, right? If it's so smart, I don't know. That's, that's actually a, a speculation, but I'm sh very sure a lot of smart people nowadays are working on those issues with this new technology. I think that's a great way to wrap up our conversation and we'll have to talk more about generative AI in the future. This has been a wonderful conversation, Ai Hong, and I want to thank our listeners for turning into and listening to On Record PR. Uh, they can visit the website onrecordpr.com, subscribe to the show, share it with their friends and colleagues, check out the show notes uh, where we'll have uh, our notes from this conversation and find all the information that they need. And as always, we welcome guest topics and ideas at podcast at onrecordpr.com. I home, thank you so much for being a guest today. We can talk for hours. I have so much to learn from you. I know our listeners have a relatively short attention span, so we'll have to uh, pick it up again sometime. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Gina. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. So have I. Thanks. On Record PR is produced by Jennifer Simpson Carr and Matt Henderson with support from the team at Furia Rubel Communications. This episode is edited by Jelko Tomic of Compost Media Flow. Music